I'd ask you guys to take some time, look at Hebrews this week, because I wanted to uh, uh, continue on our, our review exercise together before we move to the focusing on the sermon and how to put the sermon together and then preaching that that sermon i i wanted to spend a few sessions here just kind of reviewing some of the key steps uh in the process so i i was i'm using the hebrews 12 1 and 2 as sort of our uh, passage to review together um and here let me pull up your screen here so <clears throat> Hopefully you guys can can see that okay on your screen. Um, so here's our passage. In fact, let me just uh, have us uh, read it together, and then we'll we'll dive back in. So Dwayne, uh, could you go ahead and read Hebrews twelve one and two? I've got the Legacy Standard Translation that we've been using here. If you, if you're able to. Do that, that would be great. Thank you. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. All right, thank you. Now, I, I chose this passage for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that I think it's a, um, it's a short, just a few verses, so diagramming it, I think uh, you can do that in a, in a decent amount of time. But also, too, because it's a key passage in Hebrews, I think it's really the a primary application um, text in the entire book, I think. And I'll try to explain that to you uh, this evening as we go through sort of overview of the book. All right. I think it's a really, really helpful passage and hopefully encouraging to each of us because I know the challenges we face to run with endurance, to, to stay um, in the faith is has not been easy this last couple of years, especially, but uh, I know many of us, many of our brothers and sisters around the world face much, many challenges and trials, uh, some great persecution, and it is a temptation to just say it's sometimes perhaps we're tempted to say, is it worth it? Uh, I can't, I can't keep going. How do I, how do I endure? Um, I've had several friends over the years that just walk away from Christianity. They walk away from the faith because it, and they tell me it's just, it's too hard, or I don't think I believe it anymore. Or, you know, Jesus talked about in the parable of the soils, the, that there were some seeds that, that sprouted initially, but then, uh, right, the seed on the rocky soil where the cares of the world, uh, choke it out or the sorry that's the uh, thorny soil soil uh the rocky soil where the the heat of the sun the persecution the trials difficulties um cause the plant not to grow but to wither and so i think that's uh, this is an important passage just for us in our in our walk um and in all the difficulties we face, how do we endure? How do we keep going? And the people in uh, at, at the time that the writer of Hebrews is writing to them were facing um, many challenges as well, and many of them were tempted to walk away from Christ. And so he writes this letter. Actually, if we were to look at, we kept going in chapter thirteen. If Joshua had kept reading, uh, as we get to the end, he says here in verse 22, the last few verses, sort of the conclusion to this uh, epistle, notice he says this, but I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation. And that 
phrase word of exhortation is not used of a writing typically. Uh, he says, I have written you briefly, but uh, initially, I believe that the book of Hebrews actually was a sermon that was preached and then written down. It was transcribed, you know, like Spurgeon sermons or even Calvin. Uh, they didn't write out their messages. They, they preached them and then someone was there taking very good notes. Um, here, I think this particular book was preached because it, it's a word of exhortation that normally was used for proclaiming something, for preaching, not for writing. And also, too, if you go through the book, you'll see several times where the author stops and gives these warnings, right? Today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, you know, and so it really has this feel as well of a, of a sermon. And that I think was, and by the way, that at the beginning of the book, there's no typical introduction like we normally see for an epistle, right? Usually every epistle, you'll see uh, the author, right? We go to just a typical um, Pauline epistle. Well, we could go to Philemon, right? There's a good example. The author, Paul. And then usually a short description, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy. And then we see the recipient to Philemon, our beloved brother, and fellow worker, and then a greeting, grace to you and peace. Okay, and we could go through each uh, several books, Titus, same thing, right? Paul, we looked at this before, bond servant to Titus, my true child, grace and peace. Um, so if you go through all the epistles, and not just Paul, but also Peter, same thing. Peter, an apostle, Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens. So the author, Peter, the recipients, to those who are, reside as aliens, and then a greeting. May grace and peace be yours. All right, James, same thing. James, author, a bondservant of God. To the 12 tribes, recipients who were dispersed abroad, and then a greeting, greetings. But notice in Hebrews, we don't get that. It just goes right in. <laughs> the author doesn't give an introduction like a normal epistle. And so I believe uh, those factors may indicate that this, the book of Hebrews actually was a sermon that was preached. Uh, and then written down, and then at the end of the sermon, we do have, there are some final comments, like in an epistle, after he says, I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly, and so he, he does write it down, and then at the end, does give some personal comment, like we normally would see in an epistle, but um, I think this is most, most likely a, a something that had been preached. Um, I'm, I'm not certain or positive of that, but there are these elements would lead me to believe that. Um, now, the main thing I wanted to focus our attention on in this book is a, here, of course, is the passage. Last week, uh, we diagrammed this passage together, and you can go back to your notes from the previous session for that. And what I wanted to do is focus our attention just on a couple of the key steps, one being the diagram, which we did previously. Uh, normally, after the diagram, we would do textual observation, then significant words, then consult resources. Um, but for this, we're skipping those steps. But normally, if you were to preach this passage, you certainly would want to do those. I wanted to jump to the exegetical idea. Okay, again, that is the key focal point of all of our study, is to lead us to the exegetical idea, or that is the author's main point, or what we call the author's what, why, and how, all right? If you'll remember, um, the goal again of exegesis is to find the author's intended meaning. What did he intend to say to his original audience? That's the exegetical idea of the passage. Again, um, we would call it, just put it here, the author's main point in the text or referred to as the author's what why and how and the what <laughs> why and how i defined for you as, as follows that the what is the subject of the passage that is what is his main point okay 
The why is the context of the passage. That is, why did he make that point? What was the purpose of it? What, what brought the author to make this uh, statement in the passage? Both of these are critical. If you're, wanna, if you're gonna preach accurately from the passage, you have to know not just what the author's main point is, you have to know why he, he put it there. And then how, that's just, that's the outline of the passage. That's how the author develops his point. Uh, that's where the diagram, block diagram comes in to show us the structure. How does he put together this main point uh, that he's focused on? All right. And so last week, we, we already uh, gave attention to the author's what, and that usually is just found surrounding the, the main uh, sentence, the main independent clause of the passage, which, as we determined last week, was let us run the race. And you could add, you know, if you wanted the phrase with endurance, let us run with endurance the race. That's the main point here in this passage. And my contention, uh, my belief is it's really the main application point of the whole book of Hebrews. And I'll, I'll show you that from the context. So focus of these two verses is, okay, let us run uh, the with endurance the race. Now, uh, what does that mean? What is he talking about here? What is the race? And what is it? What is he talking about running a race? Is he speaking of a literal uh, event, a track event? Um, what's he talking about here? Anybody want to want to uh, tell us? So is this an obvious question or is it someone, are you guys afraid to say anything? <laughs> Tangin, you want to try? What is he talking about here? Running a race. What race is he talking about? Yeah, uh, race, racing. Yeah, the author compared the Christian life as the one who raced in the the race <laughs> yeah yeah the christian life right yeah. and so what would running that race be referring to uh so if the race is the christian life let us run the race what's he telling us to to endures with endure life, enduring life. <laughs> yeah, to to, um, to stay in the race, right? To um, to continue on in the Christian life. I think is the idea, right? Um, and that this is one reason, uh, you know, some believe Paul may have written this or preach this message or written this book is because he often likes to use athletic analogies or illustrations. Um, so some believe, you know, when he says, let us run, that's something Paul would say. Um, whoever said it is this, this idea of continuing on right in the Christian faith, not turning away, but running the race, so, uh, uh, continuing on as, as a believer, uh, enduring, as a believer, persevering. And <clears throat> he uses this uh, idea of, you know, let us run the race as a, as a picture and the laying aside every weight and the sin, you know, is the idea of the, the athletes would, would tie their clothes together or even strip down in order to not have anything get in the way or encumber them. And so he says, let us run with endurance the race. So that, that really is the the focus here, run the race of the Christian life to the end, something along those lines would be the, the focus. Um, continue on in the faith, endure. And this idea of endurance really is, this passage is part of a broader uh, section. So when we think about, okay, this is his point, run the race, continue in the Christian walk, 
uh, continue in the Christian life, don't give up, we have to ask ourselves, well, why is he saying this? Uh, to whom is he speaking or writing? And why is he telling them this? That's the why of the passage. This is the what. We need to ask the question and answer it. Why? Why did he say this? All right. And that takes us to uh, the second point. And this is where we left off last, last time we were together last week. Uh, how do we determine the author's why? Uh, usually the what will be right there in the passage. You just need to identify what's the, the main independent clause, what seems to be the main sentence, or, you know, it could be more than one main sentence, but that'll tell us what his focus is, what the point is, uh, but how do we determine the, the why of the passage? Well, sometimes the why is given directly in the passage. Sometimes we'll see a, a so that or a therefore or in order that for because these would, are all indications of a, a reason. So if you see these in the text uh, itself, then that's an indicator that the, um, the author is giving the reason or the why in the passage itself. Now, sometimes, though, that why is not in the text itself. Sometimes we have to look beyond the passage because its purpose or the reason for it is given in the broader context. All right. Um, actually, this, this would be look in the broader context. That is outside of the passage. What is said right before or right after? What is, how does this passage fit into the author's flow of thought? Um, that's, that's the idea. And so as we consider that, uh, we would be looking at, we, this would be telling us, do we understand, how do we understand the, the context of the passage? Um, and again, that would be, what, is, what does he say in the paragraph before or the paragraphs before, or what does he say after? And so here, let me pull, pull this passage up. All right. Just keep that over here. All right. All right, there we go. Okay. And that's what I want to spend time doing uh, for our, at, at, our, at the beginning of our time here this evening is talk about, identify this why. And I, I want to do it because I want to show you how understanding the whole um, uh, flow of thought of the author, how that helps us even with each passage within the book. Now, sometimes if it's hard, too hard to find the why from the broader context, we need to look all the way to the purpose of the book. And that can help us as well. So how can we determine the why? One, either from the immediate context, the passage itself, or look at the broader context that's just outside of the passage, or sometimes the book's purpose, okay? And sometimes the, actually the why, the reason that the author is making his point can actually be found from, from several of these uh, uh, possibilities, all right? So I'm going to show you that as an example from Hebrews. It's another reason I chose this passage. So first we want to talk about what is the purpose of this book? Why did the author write it? And we want to first consider that, uh, and I'm going to ask you guys to help out here and read some, some passages. But before we do that, I just want to have you take a look and notice that the author's writing primarily to believers or professing believers, because notice he many times refers to them as brethren. Uh, Hebrews 3.1, therefore, holy brethren, he calls them. And then Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, take care, brethren, he says. Uh, we could go later, Hebrews 10.19, and there's many references, I just picked a few. Therefore, brethren, and then even in Hebrews 13, the passage that uh, I just pointed your attention to. But I urge you, brethren, 
So he's, he's writing to those who are claiming to be Christians, who we would call brothers, brothers and sisters. But there's an issue here. These brothers and sisters, these professing believers are being tempted to go back to Judaism. Uh, they were facing many challenges, persecution, trials, difficulties, and they were tempted to go back to Judaism. Well, how, how do we know that? Well, notice the several warnings that are given in this book, all right? Hebrews 3, 7, uh, he says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Or if we go down to verse, actually, I'm going to have uh, Norman. Can you read Hebrews 3, verses 12 and to 14? Okay. Take care, brethren, that there not, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Uh, go ahead and read verse 15 too, please. While, while it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me. Now, consider these, these passages here. Okay. Up here in verse 7, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. He's quoting from a psalm there. And then in verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And now, again, he's speaking to those who are professing believers, but... What is the problem here? He's identifying that some of them could fall away, that some of them may have an unbelieving heart. And so he exhorts them several times in this book. He says, today, if you hear his voice, we see it here in verse eight, seven, sorry. Today, if you hear, do not harden your hearts. He repeats it again in verse 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We could go to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 4. He does the same thing. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And he's given it here as, a, as an illustration, the people of Israel. We could go to chapter 6. Okay, this is a chapter that many have, have been um, concerned about because it sounds like he's saying you can lose your salvation, but... Uh, Let's go ahead and read these verses. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Uh, Fu Wei, can uh, we have you read these? Hebrews 6, <coughs> verses yeah. 1 through 8. Okay, Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let press unto maturity, not lying again, a foundation of repentance from, from that work and of faith to a God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the restorations of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God. For in the case of those who once be enlightened and have of the heavenly gift and has been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have placed the good work, word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open sin. For God that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetations useful to those who 
do, do those for who say it is also to receive a blessing from God. But if he eat tons and twist, it is worth it worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. All right, thank you so much. All right, here, I don't want to get too far into this, but this is another warning passage. Again, the author of Hebrews here is calling them to consider uh, where they are at and what they are, what they are thinking about doing, which is walking away. And he's saying, look, if you have experienced, if you've tasted of uh, the work of the Spirit, you know, as they participated in gathering with other believers and hearing the word preached and uh, fellowshipping with other believers, singing with them, praying with them, uh, having the Spirit work through these other believers in their life, and they've tasted these things and seen the work of God and then yet still walk away, the author of Hebrews says, you're, you're in big trouble. Don't do this. If you walk away, you may never come back. And so that's really the point of this passage. He's not saying that if someone, someone could lose their salvation here. But what he is saying is that if, uh, if you are professing to know Christ and you've experienced his work in your life, then don't turn away from him because you may put yourself in great peril and never come back. Uh, he gives another warning passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, he says, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Um, and he continues on. So this is another warning passage. And then he ends it with this. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Now, why is he saying that if these people are Christians? Well, again, it's they are, they are professing Christ. Many of them are genuine believers, but some of them may not be. Those who are, and they're being tempted to walk away, to go back to Judaism, to go back to where they came from. And, and he's trying to warn them, saying, don't do that. If you do that, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So these are warning passages. And there's another one in Hebrews chapter 12. Um, let's see. I'll ask uh, Zali, if you're there. Could you read the Hebrews 12 verses 14 to 17? Fourteen to seventeen, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness, springing up, cause trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who saw his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Great. Thank you, Zali. Again, this is another warning that he gives here in chapter 12. See to it, no one comes up short of the grace of God. Again, if um, this tells us that, again, he's addressing those who are professing Christ. He calls them brothers. But then at the same time, as we saw back in Hebrews chapter 3, he warns them by saying, take care there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. So he recognizes some of them may not be genuine believers. And so they are being tempted at this point to turn back, to turn away. 
back to Judaism. How do I know he's talking about Judaism? Because the entire book is about how Jesus is the great high priest. And he, he pulls from Old Testament uh, many, many examples that, that would be important that Jews would know about. And so uh, the key here, though, there's some argument among scholars. Is it just Jews that he's speaking to? And, but uh, the point I think that's in, important to see is, is I think it is primarily Jews. But either way, he is speaking to those who are tempting, being tempted to, to turn away, to walk away from Christ. And so he spends chapter 1 all the way through chapter 10 expressing the superiority of Jesus, that he's greater than Moses, he's greater than the angels, he's the son of God, he is divine, and he is our great high priest, and he is the ultimate sacrifice. So if, if he's telling them in this book, in the first 10 chapters, look, if you walk away from Jesus, you've got nowhere to go. Who is going to be your high priest? Who is it that you can go to to deal with your sin? You have nothing. There's no way for you to find forgiveness. And so that's his the, the main idea that he's trying to, he's building a case in those first 10 chapters that Jesus is superior, that, that he is the only way to God, that he is the only means of, of forgiveness. And he gives along the way these warnings. As he's telling them, revealing the glories of Christ, as he's revealing the superiority of Christ, as he's revealing the, um, that Jesus is the only way, that he is the great high priest, Along the way, he then stops and gives these warnings. So don't turn away. So don't go back. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't be unbelieving. Uh, don't turn away. Don't fall away. All right. So it's, it's this. This is really the, the focus of these first 10, 10 chapters. And then the, the hinge of the book comes in chapter 10, verse 19. After he has made a case for the superiority of Christ, after he has emphasized that Christ is our only great high priest, uh, after he has mentioned, for example, here um, in verses uh, 10, he says, By this we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Verse 12, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time sat down at the right hand of God. So uh, verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. All right, so uh, he builds up to this point where he says, look, Jesus is the only way. He's the only sacrifice. He's the only great high priest. And then comes verse 19, therefore. That's a, a, um, a hinge. This is a hinge verse, I call them. We see this in many, many of the epistles. This is a common pattern where the author will build up, will make his case in the first part of the letter, and then the second part of the letter is the application, how they're to respond. Let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, Ephesians. Well-known example, chapter 4. Notice here in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. In the first three chapters, Paul has been describing what God has done in their salvation. In chapters 4 to 6, Paul then will describe how are you to respond to what God has done. Walk in a worthy manner. We see the same thing in verse in Romans. Romans 1 through 11, Paul spends all of this time speaking of the glories of salvation, uh, the mercies of God, his work, and all these different aspects, justification, reconciliation, adoption. Uh, he speaks of forgiveness. He speaks of election. And then he comes to verse chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, in response to all that I've said, 
about God's mercies, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. And then he goes on to tell them several ways to do that in the next four chapters. Uh, we see it in Colossians, the book you guys are uh, to study for your passage, Colossians chapter 2. The first command that he gives is actually in chapter 2, verse 6. After he describes the greatness of Christ, the person and work of Jesus, that he is divine and that he also is the one who reconciles us. Then in verse 6, he says, therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's the first command in this letter. So he builds up a foundation, a doctrinal foundation in the beginning of the letter. And then verse 6, he says, okay, this is how you are to respond. The same in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, Paul gives only one command to remember who they were before Christ. And then in chapters 4 to 6 of Ephesians, let me write this down. Ephesians 1 to 3, just one command to remember. In Ephesians 4 to 6, he gives 39 commands how they're to respond. It's the same thing here in Colossians. Colossians 2.6 is the first command. So the, first, the chapter one, there's no command. He's giving them instruction. And then in verse six of chapter two, he says, therefore, based upon who Jesus is and what he has done, as you have received him, so now walk in him. Or again, Romans. Romans 1 to 11. He speaks of, God's uh, salvation, right? The gospel that he's not ashamed of. And then Romans 12 to 16 is uh, the application. How are they to live? Therefore, he says, I urge you by the mercies of God. Um, we see this pattern in every epistle, just about. If you look at it, the author will begin with stating some important doctrinal truth and then There'll be this, we see it in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, where he reveals, he speaks of their salvation and what they've received. And then he says in verse 13, therefore, there's that word again, prepare your minds for action. And then he gives how they're to respond. Okay. Um, I could go through just about every epistle and you'll see this pattern. It's exactly what we see in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 19 is that hinge verse, that key therefore, that turns from doctrinal instruction to application. All right, what are they to do now? He's built up this in the first 10 chapters of Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 1 through 10, 18, is the focus has been the superiority of Christ. And then along the way, he does give warning passages, but there aren't too many commands in verses in those first 10 chapters. There are several commands, several imperatives, beginning in verse 19. So Hebrews 10, 19 is what I call the, the hinge of the book. And that is where he turns from, he turns from the doctrinal foundation, the case he's making to the application. Just like in our sermons, right? We, do, we should be doing this all the time where you, you, you instruct, you explain the passage, and then you tell people, okay, this is what we do with it. This is how we need to apply it. This is, this is a very common pattern in the epistles where they will give the doctrinal foundation and then the instruction, the application. All right? So this is exactly what's happening in Hebrews. And notice here in Hebrews, we have three primary commands that he gives in response to everything he said in the first 10 chapters. He then, notice he says this, therefore, 
since we have confidence to enter the holy place by a new and living way. So he's summarizing these first 10 chapters here. And since we have a great high priest, okay, so he's he's putting together everything he has said from verse one, chapter one to chapter 10. He says, therefore, and here's the main sentence, the independent clause, let us draw near. That's the first thing. Second, let us hold fast the confession. And third, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. All right, so if you were to look at um, the book of Hebrews, you would see he's building up this case. He's explaining in great detail who Jesus is and why he's superior and why he's the only way and why you should not turn away from him. And then in verse 19 of chapter 10, he begins with three, the response. Therefore, notice, again, beginning of verse 19, therefore, based upon who Jesus is, based upon what he has done, based upon the fact he's our great high priest, therefore, one, let us draw near to him, basically. Don't walk away, actually draw near. And then he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Don't forsake it. Don't disbelieve, but hold fast to it, cling to it. And then he says, uh, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And in the context here, what he's saying is, let's help each other endure. Meet together and encourage and help one another to live out the Christian life, right? So these are the three, um, what we could call the, the application of Hebrews 1, 1 through 10, 18, all right? So this is the hinge section of the book, and then he gives one more very um, strong <laughs> warning, and he's saying, look, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, meaning if we walk away, then there, if you walk away from Jesus, there's nowhere to go. Where's the sacrifice for your sins going to come from? Who is the high priest who's going to intercede for you? So that, that's the, the structure here. So Hebrews 10 26 to 31 is is another stern i would call it a stern warning passage right because notice how he ends it in verse 31 it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living god now as believers if you're a christian right you don't need to be terrified of god he's our father right if you're a believer we're his child we don't um we don't experience terror but if we're not a Christian, it is terrifying. So he's speaking here of those who walk away. So again, notice, that's why I think this is a sermon. He continues over and over and over again to appeal to them. Don't turn away. Don't harden your hearts. Don't become unbelieving. And he gives one more warning here in this section as he's turning from the, the doctrinal foundation in the first 10 chapters to what they need to do, how they need to respond. And then comes verse 32. Um, let's see. Shulong, I'm going to ask you if you could read verse 32 to uh, 34, and then I'll have you pause for a minute. Hebrews 10, 32 to 34. Okay, 
Okay. 34 to 36, right? Uh, 32 to 34 first. Oh, 32 to 34. Okay, 32. But remember the former days uh, when after being enlightened, you endure a great comfort of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy, sympathy, sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Knowing that you have for yourselves a better position and a lasting one. Okay, hold there for a minute, and I'm going to ask you to read a few more verses. Here, okay, after this this last warning section, he now appeals to them. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured. And here he introduces for the first time in the letter that word endure. He hasn't used it yet. This is the first time. And he's going to repeat it several times from this point. All right? So keep that in mind. Um, okay, can you go ahead and keep reading through verse 39? Okay, 35 to 39. Yes. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have needed an endurance endurance so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what was promised for yet in a very little while he who is coming will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he sling, slings back my soul has no pressure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those we have faith to the preserving of the soul. All right. So here in this section, he is speaking of, again, he says, he introduces this idea of endure. He says, now remember, former days so he's saying look you've gone through much already and you endured so keep going and notice he says in verse 36 you have need of endurance again now he's moving towards the point of his sermon is he's he's exhorted them he's warned them and he's saying now look brethren you need to endure that word endure has the idea of to remain under it's it's a determination to keep going no matter what happens. And he reminds them, look, you, you had some things happen to you before and you endured. So I'm encouraging, I'm exhorting you. You have need to continue to endure, continue to remain. And then he says, let me remind you of a few examples we are not of those who shrink back, but those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. How would they endure? Let me remind you, he says, of a few examples of those who have faith. And then we come to chapter 11, the famous, uh, what do they call it? The hall of faith. <laughs> uh, example after example of those who endured. Those who endured by faith. Because again, that's what he's telling him now. Look, don't walk away from Christ, but continue, endure. You need to endure. Here, let me remind you, he says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. By faith, Noah being warned by God. By faith, Abraham, when he was called. All these died in faith. By faith, Sarah, he says in verse 11. 
Um, and he continues on. By faith, Abraham. He gives another example of Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joe. Right? We see the pattern over and over again. And the theme, how is it that these people endured? He's giving illustrations here. Again, this is a great sermon. He's come to this section where he's giving illustration after illustration of those who endured. How did they endure? By faith is the obvious focus here by how he often he repeats it, right? By faith, Moses, verse 24. By faith, again, Moses kept the Passover. Notice, by faith, by faith, by faith, Rahab. And he keeps going and going all the way through. And he also mentions some who did not, some who continued to endure, uh, but he, even though they suffered great persecution and even death. And then he comes to verse 1 of chapter 12, which is really, this is, should be part of chapter 11. Because who's the primary example of faith in all of history? Who's the one who endured to the end? So he's, he's building up to the prime example of the one who endured by faith. And who is that? Our Lord Jesus, right? He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, who are those guys? Chapter 11. The ones who've gone before us. The ones who would testify of God's faithfulness. He says, therefore, because we have all of these examples who have gone before us, and he says, and this laying aside of, well, let me use the other translation. I think it's better. Um, laying aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us. He's referring here to repentance. Since we have a great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us, since we have laid aside every weight and sin, we've, we've made a profession of faith, we've repented, then let us run with endurance the race set before us. How? By looking at the prime example, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. So this verse really is the, the, the peak, the climax of the point he's trying to encourage them with to endure. Again, notice endurance. That's a key word that he began back in chapter 10, verse 32, and he continues on all the way through chapter 12. So he's saying, let us run with endurance. That is, keep, let's keep going. Don't walk away from Christ. All right? And that is then... Um, the point here that he's trying to encourage them with is this theme of let us run with endurance. I would say, again, this is the, the key statement in the whole book, uh, the whole letter of Hebrews. So as we think about the why, all right, that's, that's where we're, this whole thing was going, all right? We, we talked about the what. The what is just let us run with endurance. The race. Uh, but the why is very important. Why is he telling them this? Well, we have a few places we can see that. One is the immediate context. He says since. That word since often indicates reason. So he says since we have these examples that have gone before us. All right, that's one um, uh, why here. The, we have uh, the testimony of those, the testimony of the saints who have endured by faith. And then we have, he says, laying aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us. And if we do further study, actually, we would note that Literally, this is having laid aside. It's something they've already done. Having laid aside every weight and sin. I believe he's referring to repentance here. 
Based on those two, let us run the race with endurance. And then another reason he gives is found in verse three. So we start looking at the broader context and he says, consider him who has endured. Because Jesus endured, so too can we. So in the broader context, he notes that, that Jesus is our example. That's another reason to endure, because we look to Christ as our example, right? And in the broader context, we have to remember the several warnings that he had given about um, if we look back to chapter 10, remember, there was the warning not to turn away from Christ. So all of that to say this, okay, we spent the last hour or so <laughs> to get to this point, all right? But again, I wanted to show you, we have to understand the whole book to be able to, to see how each passage fits in. And here in Hebrews, the why of Hebrews 12 one and two, the, the reason he says, let us run the race with endurance is based upon Christ's sacrifice, Christ's example, and Christ's faithfulness and his judgment. All of these are part of the why. Why are we to run with endurance? Because Christ gave himself up for us so that we could have salvation, that he's the only sacrifice that is sufficient. And he's our example to run with endurance. And he is faithful to those who have endured in the past. And we don't want to suffer judgment if we reject him. So we need to endure. Okay. I did a lot of talking there. Um, what do you guys uh, think? Any, any questions or, or comments about that? Um, As a, a lot to take in, but I wanted that to... Was really, really, really good. I spent the, uh, long, uh, many years uh, looking at that verse uh, and uh, focusing on looking unto Jesus. Uh, of course, that's in the King James, looking unto Jesus. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can see now that that... Uh, and as we, uh, of course, uh, diagrammed it, it says, let us run. That's the... Uh, uh, the independent clause. So that uh, really changed things as far as uh, the focus and the emphasis there. I found that uh, quite enlightening and uh, encouraging. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's really powerful, men, when, when you understand the whole book. Um, that can give you confidence and understanding as to, to what, how each verse fits in. And so often, when we don't understand the flow of, the author's flow of thought or the, or the book as a whole, that's what gets us in trouble. That's when we might look at a Hebrews 6 passage and say, oh, you can lose your salvation. So oh, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> Do we understand the whole context here? Is, is he saying that, that we could lose our salvation? Or is he giving yet another warning not to, to walk away, but to endure um, because these are professing believers? We don't know. If, he doesn't know if every one of them is a genuine Christian or not. And so that's why he's giving these warnings. But understanding how the whole book what is being said that reveals that gives insight into each part of it and i think this is a great example in hebrews 12 of that that if you understand what he's saying in the whole book i think it really um, gives opens up these two verses and it gives you conviction when you preach them it's like i know this is what he's saying i know this is uh what the holy spirit is intending us to understand through this author Anyway, any other comments or questions or thoughts about this, about Hebrews, about these two verses? 
I've come to the conclusion too that Paul has written this. The last few comments he makes in the, the book of uh, Hebrews kind of seals it. And he, it's somebody sitting in prison in, in Rome. And he's a real close buddy of uh, Timothy. And uh, I read the other day, Antithetasius, Antithetasius, this, uh, uh, the one that fought all the battles on the Eridan controversy, uh, he was very clear about Paul having written it. And he goes right back to uh, a, little over two, a, this a little over 200 years after Christ. He, and he quotes the whole scripture as we have it, the first one that does that. And uh, that gives him a little weight. And uh, yeah, it's uh, so interesting to see what the scholars, I, I think there's a lot of poor scholarship out there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Paul is probably the strongest case for the author. I just like what Origen said, you know. Um, he said, you know, who, who wrote Hebrews? Uh, only God knows. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there's a good case is made for Paul. There's, there's many uh, examples. I think a good case is made for Apollos as well, but um, some even think Luke, and I, it's a possibility. But yeah, Paul, Paul seems to be the most likely. I haven't really landed i don't have a conviction on that um but i think paul's is a good a good uh, possibility but the focus here and perhaps we don't have the authors you know for give name given for sure though the early church fathers many of them thought it was paul um is because the focus here isn't on who wrote this it's you know it's on this message and and really the focus is on the recipients in this letter because of what they were being tempted to do uh, which was walk away and he's trying to plead with them look if you do that there's no other there's no other means to be forgiven jesus is it <laughs> if you if you will leave jesus you have nowhere to go except judgment so other comments pastor philip you have any thoughts or questions no question but uh pastor like pastor doing uh it is very encouraging and so many times i read this one but i did not get the whole picture. Uh, so it is very beneficial to learn from you. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Okay, great. Very good. Anyone else? Uh, any questions on this? I want to make sure you understand there's no questions before we press forward. Th this step, this exegetical idea, you know, it's where we're putting everything together. So all the study, and that includes, as I tried to show you here, that includes what we learned about the whole book and the author's flow of thought and his, his purpose in writing, uh, because all of it will come into focus as you look at each individual passage and see how does this verse or verses, how do they fit in what the author is trying to say. And here in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, I think they fit the entire book, the purpose of the book, and then also the flow of thought. So that's why I wanted to go through this exercise, and all of this will be in your notes. So if, if you weren't following everything, you can go back and read through the notes uh, that I send you or that I post. Um, hopefully that will help as well. But I really wanted you to see the author's why um how you can get it from the the broader context of the book okay well let's let's get to the so the what why and then the how so the what is the author's main point that's the subject of the text the why is the reason the author gave that point that's the context of the text and then the how is the, the structure. How did the author develop that point? And that takes us all the way back to 
our our friend the the block diagram that um, Dwayne mentioned a moment ago, and that it's what what we already have done. So we're not gonna we already did that last week. So you can take a look at the notes there to see that. But as Dwayne mentioned, the main clause here, the main sentence is let us run the race. And then notice he gives two reasons, two motivations why to run the race. And he gives those before the independent clause. So he says, one, since we have a great cloud of witnesses, that's chapter 11, basically. <laughs> and then he says, having laid aside every weight, um, again, I think it's uh, in, in the uh, original Greek, it's more the idea of having laid aside every weight. He's speaking there of repentance, which again is something he's brought up in the whole book. Brethren, don't turn away from the commitment you've already made. Uh, so he's, he's reminding them of those two reasons that he has discussed in the book already. Based on those two motivations, let us run the race. And then he tells us how to run with endurance and fixing our eyes on Jesus. Okay, that's our outline. That's the structure. Uh, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, here we go. So here's our author's what, why, how for Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. All right, the motivation to run with endurance. Here, let's see if there's a way I can. Let's do this so you can see all of this. Um, let's see if I can make this work here. How about this? This will be better. All right. Give me one second. I'll, I'll make this a little neater here. I'm just trying to get oh, what happened. That was kind of weird. Uh oh. Okay. Things are freezing up on me here. Um, <laughs> we must endure computer malfunctions. Ah. Uh. What I was trying to do <laughs> was put the diagram next to the outline so you could see it more clearly. But apparently, my computer has other ideas. Okay, here we go. Ah, praise God. All right. Let's see if we can make it work. Okay. Ah, yes. All right. See the... The fruit of endurance. There we go. Okay. I just wanted you to, to see here on this, the outline. So notice uh, these the two reasons here. Since we have so great a cloud, that is remember God's faithfulness. All right. That the witnesses, by the way, are not uh, witnessing of their accomplishment. They're, the word witness means testify. They're testifying of God's grace as they endured by faith. That's the idea. So they're crying out. They're not cheering us on. They're saying, look, keep going because God was faithful to me as I endured. That's what the picture is here. So it's like the crowd, um, you know, and the notice the picture here is a, a race, right? So an athletic event and you're running and there's a crowd around you and they're cheering you on by saying, keep going because God was faithful to me. They're witnessing, they're testifying of the Lord, not of themselves. And so that's the idea here is motivate the motivation to run is to remember God's faithfulness in the life of others who have gone before us. And then the second reason 
having laid aside every weight, that is then remember your repentance. You made a commitment. <laughs> Keep it <laughs> is the idea. And then the means to run with endurance. That is how. One, look to Jesus. Oops. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. And then I said, look to his example, which he goes into here. How did Jesus endure um, the cross? So that's an example that he gave. Okay. So that's how I outlined the, the passage based on the, the diagram. All right. So that's the what, why, how for Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. All right, so you have your, your sermon ready to you can go ahead and get ready for your sermon from Hebrews 12 this week, right? I just gave you a gave you your outline. But no, I do a little more study before that. But that is all that together then gives us the authors what, why, and how. And once you have this, you're ready to preach this text. Uh Tom Gain, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, but my question is uh, the English uh, meaning, <laughs> the Jews say also. And uh, yeah, how motivation to run, but means to run with endurance. So the word means what is the meaning here in this kind of uh, thing? I often see this kind of means. The word means in oh, other yeah. theological. Okay. Thank yeah, you. the word mean um, mean can be can refer to uh, a a uh, a harsh person. Okay, he's mean. <laughs> it can refer to um, like the meaning of a word. So. It, uh, um, how would I say this? To give understanding. And then the means of something is how. How to do something. All right? And that's how I'm using it here. So maybe to be clear, I would say uh, um, how, how to run the race with endurance is what, what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see now. Okay, but Thank you. There's a, the English word means is this idea of it can, is a how. The means to do something is the way you do something. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, it's not related. I also heard about, for example, in election case, uh, some people, some pastor explain in that way that uh, if a one election, for example, elections, in election itself, a means of salvation is included something like that so the means of salvation means in in the means of salvation so what will be the meaning <laughs> means of salvation <laughs> yeah yeah so this is the thing uh, if i were to say um he means uh, uh he means let's see what would be a good or, or here, let me do this. The passage means you must, you know, follow Christ, let's say. Now, in this case, it's used as a verb. All right? And, it's, and it, the idea is uh, to give understanding, to explain, something like that. Okay? Or you can use the passage as an, uh, the word as a noun. The means, ah, the means to your salvation um, are in Christ. And here, the, I, this is being used as a noun in this case. And so it is the, notice the article, the means. Okay, so it's used as a noun here, and that is uh, either how or way. The way to your salvation, how you are saved. Is in Christ. Okay. 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 Now I see. I got or it. Or you can Thank say you. <laughs> uh, the mean man. 
Okay, that means he, he is uh, unkind. All right, so here it's being used as an adjective. In fact, I can just say that. Okay, it's, it's describing the man, the mean man. He's a harsh man. Here, the means to your salvation, this is being used as a noun. And in this sentence, means is being used as a verb. Okay, and that's why it gives them different meanings. <laughs> meanings. Thank you. It's okay. a bit basic for you all guys, I know, but... No, no that's a great question. <laughs> so thank you for asking, because I'll bet that means that someone else had the same question. <laughs> so, yeah, all I'm trying to say is how to run with endurance. And I use the word means because it starts with an M and uh, like motivation. So it can make it a little more memorable, which uh, actually next week we'll talk about that. How do you come up with a good outline? Um, you know, how can you word it in such a way that it's effective? All right. So we'll talk about that next week. But thank you for the question. So we could even say to make it clearer how to run with endurance. And you could even say here, instead of motivation, we could say why to run with endurance. OK, maybe that makes it a little clearer. OK, uh, before we. Uh, finish the, tonight, I want to give you guys a real a short exercise because um, once you complete, you know, these steps for the, uh, once you find the exegetical idea, what is the next thing that you do? Okay, now that you go, okay, based on all this study, I, I believe this is the exegetical idea. This is the author's what, why, and how well well then what's next well the next step is to say okay how do i go from the author's world to our world how do i from going from the author's intended meaning to what i need to to communicate to teach to preach to my hearers and that is the timeless truths all right which we we talked about at the end of the last unit but what I wanted to do was uh, just have you identify the timeless truths in this Hebrews passage. And again, remember, those timeless truths is the bridge between exegesis and exposition. It's the bridge between the author's world and our world. It's the bridge between the author's intended meaning and, and what I am to say to, to our present, my present day hearers. And so the timeless truths are essentially the doctrinal truths within the passage that the author bases his application on. So the timeless truth is what truth applies both in their day and in our day. It's not bound to culture. It's not bound to time. It's not... Um, it can apply to any person, any situation, at any time, in any place. It's timeless. That's the idea. So uh, what I'd like you to do is look at the passage here in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and just see what, what are the timeless truths that you can see here. That is, what are these doctrinal truths in this passage that would apply to anyone at any time, all right? So for example, uh, Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. That's a timeless truth. That, that wasn't just something that applied back in the day that this was written. He's always the author and uh, perfecter of faith, right? That's, that's a timeless truth. Um, not specific only to the author and the audience. So just take a few minutes and uh, I'll expand this a little bit, make it easier, hopefully for you to see. And just take a look at, at the text here and see, identify a few timeless truths. I'll give you five minutes to do that. And then we'll come back and discuss that briefly and, and I'll 
let you go for the night. But I wanted to finish this this step before we ended for the evening. Okay. So what timeless truths do you see here in uh, this passage in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? All right, take a few minutes. Okay. Let's see. Uh, anybody want to volunteer? Any timeless truths that they see here in the passage? The faithfulness of God. Faithfulness of God. Or, uh, yeah, God is faithful. Maybe we could. All right. Good. Any others? I think the timeless truth, Pastor, would be the why. Okay. The, so, you, you put the why, what. Uh, I think it's the, the why sums it all up because of Christ's sacrifice, uh, his faithfulness to those who have endured, and his uh, severe judgment. Okay. Uh, so, how, yeah, how would you word that then? Uh, I would word that as um, Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, and um, endured, um, and, and, and endured the cross, despising the shame. Okay, so maybe Jesus uh, is the author of faith. He's the chief example. Jesus endured the cross. Um, by focusing on the joy of obedience. Okay, who for the joy set before him. Yes. Endured. Um, yeah, I would say Jesus is our example. Yeah. Of how to endure, right? It says, uh, right, fixing, fixing our eyes. So we could see several actually here. Uh, Jesus lived a life of faith perfectly. That's the idea of a perfecter. Perfecter, yeah, of faith. Um, okay, good. So yeah, there's several actually there in that idea. Any any others? Again, these are doctrinal. So pastor, yeah, Philip. Yeah. So, Pastor, how about sin is real and very easily entangled or catches us? Okay. Yes. Good. That's true for any any person at any time, right? That's a yes. timeless truth. Um, how about this? Jesus sits. At the right hand right. of the and Father. Yes. That's a timeless truth, right? Um, any others you guys see? Um, how about this? Many, many saints have endured by faith many saints i should say uh before us have endured by faith right that was the whole point of chapter 11 and so even though it was said in chapter 11 notice that therefore since connects this passage to chapter 11 since we have so great a cloud of witnesses that is uh that statement there is chapter 11. <laughs> All right, so 
timeless truths sometimes can actually be in another part passage, but it's connected in some way to your specific text. And that this would be an example of that. Okay, maybe one one or two more. Anybody? Can I can I say, Pastor, that uh, Jesus laid aside every weight of our sin? Um, using laying aside every weight and the sin which easily entangles us. So we say Jesus laid laid aside every weight of our sin. Well, in this case, he's speaking of the 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 person he's talking to. So Jesus. Uh, didn't have sin that he would lay aside. He made a sacrifice so we could lay aside our sin, but he never laid aside sin because he never sinned. Uh, so this is speaking here of, of us laying aside every sin. Um, but the way we can do that is because of his sacrifice. So you could say that we can lay aside sin because of Christ's Sacrifice. You could say it that way. That, that's good. Okay, well, this gives a, a, you an example of, of what to focus on or look for here in uh, Timeless Truths. All right, so they just anything that you see in the passage that uh, is a truth that can apply in any time or place or people. OK, and obviously, uh, if we had done the full word studies, consulted resources, textual observations, all the other work on this passage that we skipped, because this is just an exercise, you know, an example uh, that would have given us more insight into the meaning of all that he's saying here. OK, so um, I understand it's hard to do this timeless truths if you haven't done all the other study, but I just wanted to at least give you an example of what to, what to do in this particular step. Okay, so that takes us then through all the way through. We've already done the first 10 steps. If you remember the last session of unit three, we talked about meditation. So next week, uh, Lord willing, we're going to turn our attention to the sermon. Okay, now that we know what the author is saying, now that we've identified the timeless truths, we've meditated on the text. Okay, I'm ready to write the sermon out. How do I do that? Where do I begin? What does a, a good sermon look like? How do I put it together? What should be included in a good sermon? Uh, so that'll be the focus of the next uh, few weeks together is we'll, we'll look at, at the, that part of it, okay? Well, thank you for your endurance this evening. Appreciate, um, uh, appreciate that and just seeing you, you all here. So uh, if there are any questions that you have on what we talked about, again, you're always welcome to message me uh, if if you have a question that comes up later or maybe something you, you didn't want to ask in in our class time but um, I'm always happy to answer any questions you might have um, you know and so feel free to send me a Facebook message or a message on whatsapp and um, I'd be happy to help okay all right Oh, uh, Pastor Philip, I'm going to ask if you could uh, close us in prayer. Uh, I would appreciate that. Sure.